thank you for coming back, despite the nice weather. And thanks to the organizers for having me and giving me this opportunity to accompany students, the food, uh, but also the opportunity to return to this topic. Uh, my original background was in physics, but then I moved into theology and philosophy and had the opportunity to write a dissertation officially in the Faculty of Theology titled Beyond the Big Bang, Quantum Cosmologies and God. So at that point, it appeared in 1990, at that point I was very much into these topics. Uh, and after that I moved into, well, partly other sciences and other roles. Uh, so uh, this was a kind of return for me and I learned a lot about current discussions. Though it surprised me as well, or I learned as well that not that much has changed, I think, since around 1990. I mean, we still already at that point made the argument that the Big Bang theory is not about the Big Bang, but about the subsequent evolution. Uh, we had the discussion about complete theories and uh, their possibilities, the anthropic principles, the many worlds issues. So I think the issues are pretty constant, but that's maybe comforting for a philosopher or a theologian that the issues are not changing uh, so quickly, but that they're more persistent. Um, my own trajectory, maybe just as background also to some of the things I will be saying, brought me to a chair in philosophy of religion, but in a secular state university uh, where there's not really a theology faculty, it's really a religious studies environment. So we study religion as a human phenomenon. And that's partly, I think, shaping some of the comments I'll make, that the philosophy of religion is somewhere situated between the study of religious movements, religious people, whether you agree or disagree, and the theological project of thinking yourself, well, what do you believe? What do you consider realistic? Uh, so there's this kind of tension between participating and being observing or being an insider as a partner in the discussion and an outsider, more, uh, well, the historian or the ethnographer looking at what's going on. Uh, and I think both projects are important and they both need to inform each other. Uh, one more comment about the lecture. Um, I once heard a, a Dutch physicist at Hof say he would have a lecture in four parts. The first part would be understood by everyone so that we have a kind of shared starting point. The second would be understood by the, the specialist in the audience and himself. The, second, the third part would be understood by him and not yet by some of the others. So that would be the new part. And the fourth would be about things he didn't understand either. Uh, I'm sure there will be some of the first part where you say, oh, I don't know, I know that already. And quite some of the fourth part where you think, I don't know it either. And you may be right. Uh, and maybe some of the, another type as well, namely that some of you know it much better than I do. Uh, I'm quite sure of that as well. Well, so far for some comments. So a kind of preview. I'll start a bit with a kind of history, at least in a very sketchy form, uh, about natural theology and the arguments that have come up there, and then move to a couple of considerations about the Big Bang Theory and the challenges or the developments uh, and the reflections if you go, well, beyond the Big Bang Theory and towards the later part, I end with one part, think about how to think about God, and the other, how to think about the project of theology. So that's more, uh, that's kind of outline. So natural, the natural theology, as I take the term here, is typically of the European intellectual history in the 17th, 18th century, uh, 19th century some, uh, where you find people arguing from nature to religious conclusions. Observations, there are famous, but, well, the most famous one is William Paley's book with the title Natural Theology, but there are others earlier where you'll find, in a sense, a whole natural history of that time, knowledge of biology, of astronomy, of geology, uh, and each time with a kind of uh, concluding section saying, well, this shows how well it's all organized. So there must be someone who organized it. That's a kind of general pattern of the natural theology tradition. Uh, and it's often understood as seeking by, by contemporary, by, by our time, as using science to support theology or to support religion. Uh, actually, in the 17th and 18th century, it is as much 
using religion to support science. It was a time when the activity of science was not that automatically having a general acceptance and using, associating it with religious beliefs made obvious that this was a respectable project. It was a very good work by John Brooke, uh, Peter Harrison, an article in Theology and Science on the early days of the Royal Society, where you see this coming out very clearly. So natural theology had two sides. It was linking theology and science, but it was supportive, uh, depending on what you assume, for the other side. Um, if you look at what kind of disciplines are included in natural theology, uh, it's a lot of biology, uh, observations on nature, um, also quite some physics, astronomy, uh, geology, but for instance chemistry is far less present in that kind of discourse. And I think that's not accidental, but it has to do about, with the nature of the different disciplines and the nature of the project. The presence of astronomy, most clearly, is the presence of an area of science where we do observations, we try to understand something, but we don't change it. We don't change the, the stars. Uh, and in a sense, biology and physics were more or less of the same kind, whereas chemistry was far more an engineering type of discipline, with its roots in alchemy, in the effort to transform reality, to purify impure substances. Uh, it had a different kind of uh, web of associations, uh, leaning more towards uh, a spiritualist uh, understanding of religion than one that was looking for God as a lawmaker and trying to find the laws of nature. That was more fitting for physics, astronomy, and biology. I think also mathematics was a bit an outsider to this, uh, but that's uh, maybe more because mathematics is not a science, but is more an it's set of instruments. Um, yeah. In natural theology, it's common to, un to distinguish some different types of arguments and uh, the main one, it was already mentioned by Thomas Tracy as well, is what's called the cosmological argument. And to summarize it briefly, it's kind of us answer to the question, why is there, or raising at least the question, why is there uh, something rather than nothing? So it's rooted in the fact that there is something, kind of empirical start, but not very empirical. I mean, it's not very specific experiments, but it's kind of general uh, saying, well, there is something, and that's not self-evident. Uh, closely related, but still somewhat different, is the design argument, which is the more common version, I think, in the natural theology tradition, and allows for much more variation, because there's mu much more uh, input there. Uh, where, why is the world the way it is? So why are biological organisms adapted to their environment? Or why is the shape of the Earth such or the position of the earth such that we have seasons, uh, summer and winter and spring and so on. Uh, all those kind of why questions that are about specific phenomena and that are understood as being uh, somehow in need of an explanation and something not just in need of an explanation but something we are grateful for and hence we appreciate. So it's an explanation that has something uh, of a value dimension to it as well. Uh, there's a third type of argument, which I mentioned, that's not typical of the natural theology tradition, but older in the, uh, well, and these are also older, but um, uh, what's called the ontological argument, which is more an argument that works by definition. Uh, and so it doesn't need any empirical input. The classic representative is Anselm, uh, uh, 11th century, I think, well, somewhere 11th century, a theologian, uh, who, in a sense, proves that God exists by starting with the definition of God. God is that greater than which nothing can be thought of. And then he argues that that cannot be something that just might exist, because if it were possible that it would not exist, then you could think of something greater, namely the same being having existence. And that would be something more significant than just the idea of God. Well, that's a, a kind of pure philosophical type of discussion, which is more like mathematics in a sense, or logic, than like empirical science. So it's a, a different category. Natural theology has been criticized. Uh, it has been criticized 
already, say, in the 18th century, 19th century, 18th century, for instance, David Hume. Uh, I think the main challenge to the design type of argument came with the rise of an alternative of Darwin's theory, of evolutionary theory, uh, which explained at least many of the adaptations that originally were taken as surprising facts that needed a separate explanation. And many of those became part of, well, they're part of the whole fabric of nature of how evolution works out. So the design of the eye, for instance, uh, for Paley, early 19th century, a good sign of, uh, of a design became something that was naturally understood. The impact of evolutionary explanations on the mainstream of the design tradition, I think, has been splitting it in two different streams. Some were very, uh, well, appreciative of the design arguments, and they didn't want to let it go, and so they, in a sense, rejected evolution. Uh, that's one way. If you think the price is too high to pay uh, to stay with the, the design arguments, uh, and of course, descendants of that are uh, are there up to the present day. And the other move, also present immediately at the same time, was to accept the science, to accept evolutionary theology, uh, biology, and to move the design argument up one level and say, well, maybe that we don't need to explain in detail why different organisms have the different forms they have, but why are the laws of nature such? Why is there so much time that uh, evolution can take its course? So it moves up to a higher level of abstraction, and I think that's the kind of line where the anthropic principle type of discussion in cosmology is a kind of culmination of that uh, looking at the most general, what are the conditions so that life-generating processes are possible. So I think both lines are possible. Um, yeah. Now I'll focus on cosmology, but I'll make occasional con connections to this first cause argument, which is, I think, the main cosmological argument that thinks that coming to existence need a cause, but that cause needs another cause, and so on. So there's a kind of chain of explanations, and somehow that has to start somewhere. That's the kind of line of thinking. And uh, when the Big Bang Theory came on the scene, uh, it was taken by some as being precisely the fitting this, this program. Uh, as far as I know, in 1951, uh, then Pope Pius XII uh, said something very positive words about the Big Bang Theory, but drawing it in a highly theological framework. Science has opened the door and there we see the Creator, uh, which was not appreciated by some of the proponents of the Big Bang Theory, including uh, Lemaitre, uh, and Michael Heller knows much more about him than I do, but, uh, and I have read by Erna McMullen, also a very critical uh, discussion. So it was not the position of those involved, but it was one response, and I think there may have been other popular responses. And the backside of that, or the, the, it triggered the opposing force as well of saying those that didn't like the theistic implications suggested to say, well, if that's the consequence, we reject the Big Bang Theory as well as a kind of implicit uh, theistic incursion in science. So the, the polarization was one, and I think those that wanted it as a scientific project were eager to keep it free from this uh, pro and contra theological interpretations. Uh, however, let us still take a moment to think if you were to take this Big Bang model as kind of moment of creation, what would it uh, imply, how to think about it? And so if it's taken as the moment of creation, as a specific event, of course violating some of the things Bill Staker said uh, about creation not being so much one event, but if, if you try this, uh, you get into various questions. Uh, one is, if it happened at that time, 
why didn't it happen earlier? I mean, if time already is there and there's a kind of empty stage waiting, why would God have been waiting, well, for an infinity of time before saying, well, let's start? Um, and also, why didn't it happen uh, at this place rather than at that place? And if it might happen uh, at some point, why didn't it happen more than once? So why wouldn't we see interacting, uh, expanding universes somehow? Uh, it raises those kind of questions because it places it somehow, there's no reason to choose one moment in time, uh, one moment in space and say, well, that's where this starts. Uh, that's not a totally new problem, actually. Uh, one of the uh, early theologians, Augustine, around 400, uh, wrote about this problem already in his confessions. Uh, first he says, well, I'm not going to ask uh, to do it with a joke, but then still he puts it in, namely said, uh, you might, uh, well, what was God doing before creating the world? He was making hell for those who asked those questions. Uh, but I'm not taking that answer, says Augustine, and then he comes with the more serious one, saying, well, the question is wrongly posed. The question assumes that time exists before the beginning, but time is tied up with creation. In order to have time, you need to have clocks, you need to have change, you need to have something that marks the progress of time. And if there's no creation, there's nothing changing, there's no way to, to establish that there's time. So the question about a before is dismissed as not being adequate. Uh, so the alternative then is to say, well, if you take this view of a creation as a sudden start, it's the creation of time. It's the creation of reality and time together and not of creation at a moment in time. Okay, I think that's one way to get away from it, but then uh, the Big Bang Theory is not uh, the complete answer, and there are many more issues. So what we see and heard about at this conference is uh, further developments. So beyond or after following after the Big Bang Theory, minor aside, my book was said beyond the Big Bang. So I was asked again and again this question, what's on the other side? Uh, but I had originally proposed the word theory as well, but that the publisher had skipped that term. They like shorter titles and, and more provocative titles. But I think it's more adequate to think, well, we are asking about what if might subsequent theories deliver. Um, and one of the, uh, one, family of, of models is, of course, that our observable universe then is seen as part of a much larger universe, maybe even this multiverse idea, uh, so that the Big Bang is not so much the beginning of everything, but rather is maybe the beginning of our observable universe, just as if I, from within my body, would look back, there would be a beginning of my existence, but that would not have been the beginning of all existence, so that it is a kind of particular and not a, the universal beginning. Um, we've had some discussion on that also yesterday with George Ellis's lecture and other moments. I'm not too concerned about multiverse ideas, actually. Uh, I think we have various historical precedents. Uh, there has been, there was a question about whether the Greeks believed in plurality of worlds. Well, it has been a debate at least. Uh, and of course it didn't fit when there is a natural center in the structure of reality, but it did fit some others. Uh, but anyhow, there has been this discussion first in terms of solar systems, might there be other suns, and at some point we realized that all those spots, all those stars are other suns, and later there were certain nebulae, certain um, uh, spots in observational astronomy, and there was a question whether they were clouds in the galaxy or whether they were other galaxies, but the term at that point was island universes, whether they might be separate, well, universes. Of course, no one anymore would consider them separate universes. Uh, they have become part of our universe. So the, the, what seems as a kind of multiplicity has been incorporated. I think nowadays, if you think about the possibility, well, 
10 years ago, if you would think about possibility of other planetary systems, the answer would have been, well, we don't have any strong evidence, we can't measure them, the effects are too tiny, but we do believe they exist. Uh, our, our planetary system came into being, and if one comes into being, there might be others as well. So we have a tendency to assume that we don't know the details, but it might have happened elsewhere. And similarly, I think, for the extraterrestrial life type of debate, uh, we don't know all the details, we don't know all the conditions, but why exclude that it might be elsewhere? So I think there's this kind of tradition that, uh, yes, there might be things we haven't observed yet, uh, but given what we know, what we have observed, we start filling it in, uh, saying, well, it might be. Uh, in this case, I think it's primarily driven by theory. If the theory allows it, and we take part of the theory serious, then we might say, well, as long as we take that, serious, that theory as a guidance to our understanding, uh, we might take it serious. Uh, let me see, I wrote so many small things in margin. Oh, yeah, what does it do with the design type of argument? Uh, if we were to accept a multiverse theory, and at some point maybe start off a plurality of domains and call it a universe again, because I, I find the word multiverse linguistically a problem at some point, and it becomes a new universe level. Uh, I think it would undermine some of the design argument, like Darwin's development did undermine some of the specific design argument. Uh, you wouldn't need to explain all the particulars, well, for the evolutionary argument in biology, because you say, well, if you have an evolutionary process, then that's within the range of things to be expected. And so, too, if you have this kind of multiple domains, you would say, well, somewhere in those domains there might be the right conditions for life. Uh, so the kind of fine-tuning argument as a specific argument, I think, would be gone. It might recur at the higher level that you have somehow to need the conditions for this uh, universe with multiple domains to arise. Or it might become so limited that you basically only are left with the cosmological argument. That in a sense, the specifics are more or less explained and that you're more left with the, the general question, why is it that it happens? So I, I do think it reduces a bit the power of design arguments if you have this more general scheme of explanation. But, uh, well, the design argument might be under pressure, but the cosmological argument will continue anyhow. Um, so if models that somehow explain our observed universe, which we call, uh, say, the, with the Big Bang Theory understood in a larger whole, that moves our horizon, our understanding of how far can we have a sense of what's going on, uh, but it does not resolve the question of the cosmological argument. Well, you might then, I think that was partly in Bill Steger's lecture, say, well, in the end you need a metaphysical conclusion. You could, I think, also say, well, that is like a horizon, it moves. If you m try to go closer to the horizon, the horizon moves away from you, you never get there. Uh, and that is more a kind of agnostic situation that we humans find ourselves in. A passage I find inspiring is from a, a physicist, Catholic physicist, Charles Misner, in a book, Cosmology, Theology and History, I think was the title, or some other order of those three terms. Um, where he says, saying that God created the universe does not explain either God or the universe. So he says, it's not really serving as an explanation, but it keeps our consciousness alive to mysteries of awesome majesty that we might otherwise ignore, and that, that does observe, deserve our respect. So he says, the religious uh, expression, God created the universe, well, he, he moves away from saying, well, that's the kind of final piece of the puzzle. It's the explanation. It's more saying, well, we don't have the explanation, but it's an expression of, of awe, of being impressed, of being without, uh, lost for words, rather than filling in the puzzle, the agnostic uh, element there. One side, of course, not all models were in a sense, beyond the Big Bang, in a sense of moving to a 
a larger, earlier stage or whatever, uh, one, and this is by current standards, of course, very old uh, reference, but uh, I think it's still kind of mindset, an article by Hartle and Hawking on how the universe, uh, well, I think the title was already creation from nothing uh, of the article, but anyhow, they, they have a certain model where the universe starts, uh, no, it doesn't start because they challenge the concept of time. They say time is just one way of ordering our description of it. So we don't have this concept of time, uh, but we have a way of calculating the likelihood of one universe rather than another. Uh, and then it has this uh, phrase, uh, in other words, the ground state of their way of calculating is the amplitude for the universe to appear from nothing. And there's this from nothing, a creation out of nothing uh, in a scientific paper. And uh, I think it's over, overstated and some others have said so similarly, I think during this conference, because it assumes already the whole body of mathematics that they allow and to talk about the amplitude or the possibility, probability assumes that you have a certain measure on possible universes, that you can somehow work on it. It's not really a, a nothing in the abstract philosophical sense of nothing, but it is uh, loaded with a lot of assumptions. Uh, and by the way, they also cannot avoid the temporal time of way of phrasing it, to appear from. Uh, something similar happened, I think, yesterday in the lecture by George Ellis, where it also spoke of emerging out and talking about pre-existing possibilities, uh, we seem, in our language at least, to be very naturally inclined to put it on a temporal scale, even if we try to, like they, uh, certainly Hawking and Hartle, try to say we're not in this temporal scale. They use the word to appear from. So whether there's a first cause in the definition, well, they challenge whether you can have a, a unique order where you can point out one as the first, uh, or others would say, well, there are earlier stages. Uh, so I think that's very much a, at least as a philosopher, I take it that the scientists haven't solved it, sorted this out. And I do expect actually that it won't be sorted out, but that we will have this kind of plurality of op options uh, again and again. The other part, word, of course, there is the word cause, whether that is the most adequate term. In a sense, <coughs> well, we have had various challenges, but at least in terms of efficient cause, I think that's the kind of what's making it. Uh, there is this question whether that's in the reflection on it always the best term to use. It, it seems to push us always to earlier stages and earlier stages. And as an analogy, at least, I would like to suggest to think about another way of thinking about the relation between, say, the fundamental and the derived aspects of it. And one way might be the mathematical structures. If you have an axiomatic system like classical geometry, uh, you have certain axioms and you have all the theorems that follow from it. And that, that is also a structure where you can say, well, something is, in a sense, grounding the other, the truth of the consequences of the theorems uh, depends on, is, is derived from the, the fundamental axioms. But it's not so much a kind of causal relations where you find uh, a temporal sequence, where it's the one coming first. It's more structural. It's how the things fit together. So I think there is a kind of alternative way of thinking about it, maybe where it's moving away, away a bit from, from causal language. This is for me a bit kind of experimental paper. It's not that I've sorted this out and I'm just conveying the results. It's more uh, reflections where I'm trying to say, well, maybe there might be a way to do that. Uh, which raises, of course, uh, if you take a, an approach like that, this, the question of what the standing of mathematics is. Um, George Ellis's paper, I think, was leaning very much to a Platonist view of mathematics and then saying, well, that's where it begins, it has a kind of ontology with it, has a kind of uh, standing with it. Uh, I'm more hesitant whether that's 
fully adequate. In that sense, I'm far more uh, bottom-up from within our own existence. Uh, there's something strong about mathematics. There, it's cultural, independent, uh, in that sense, universal. Uh, if extraterrestrials ever pa cross our path, uh, we would share the mathematics, uh, I would expect. So there's something hugely impressive about mathematics. Uh, but uh, so the sense of discovery, of saying, well, I find it and it's not up to me to make it up, uh, that's clearly there. But whether those, those universals also need existence, uh, that's a step that I'm less certain about. Moving to more explicit uh, theological language, maybe this might be a direction to think about God. And I picked a quote actually from a, a novelist, John Fowles, uh, known from a film, The French Lieutenant's Woman, and a book, The Magus, and some other writings. Uh, and this is a, a book of, of philosophical reflections by him. And I have a slightly longer quote here. Uh, this, the ubiquitous absence of God in ordinary life is the sense of non-existing, of mystery, of incalculable potentiality, this eternal doubt that hovers between the thing in itself and our perception of it, this dimension in and by which all other dimensions exist. And then comes this image, the white paper that contains a drawing, the space that contains a building, the silence that contains a sonata, the passage of time that prevents a sensation or object continuing forever. All these are God. Well, he uses scare, scare quotes. Uh, I mean, he, he, but he says, that's where I would like to use the word God. Uh, so as kind of the white paper that makes the drawing possible, and we tend to focus on the drawing, but it's the, the condition for the possibility of it. Uh, and so too for the silence and the music. Um, well, that's part of a larger project, I think, of thinking whether we could think of God more in imminent terms. I think this moves towards uh, less this kind of dualism that uh, the causal language brings as God being the creator of and more trying to articulate it in a more imminent way without losing all distinctions. Um, The, there's another direction to touch upon as well, not talking in terms of ground. Well, there are spatial metaphors, of course. Uh, we don't cannot escape our kind of metaphors, and that's more moving upwards or increasing abstraction, uh, which I think is also useful and also is to some extent applicable to mathematics. If you think about mathematics, uh, well, numbers are in a sense coming out of abstraction from real objects or uh, geometry from physical distances and so on. Uh, and thinking about uh, the theistic language in terms of abstraction, uh, I, I was inspired by someone, a British author, Stuart Sutherland, uh, who has a, a book, um, what's the title? God, Jesus, and Belief, The Legacy of Theism. So, subtitled The Legacy of Theism, so he claims not to be in theism, but still to pick up some of the important elements of it. Um, and there he speaks of theism as articulating a view from eternity, subspecie eternitatis. Uh, and he says that's not a point of view that we ever have, uh, but it's kind of limiting case where you try to abstract from all the particular of views you have. And in a moral sense, that may be important because we all have interests. And so if you have a, a, a discussion with someone, you might say, well, this is my preferred position because it fits me better. But somehow we think higher of those that try to articulate in general terms why this is the better option and that's uh, the wrong option. Uh, in morality, there is this tendency towards making things more abstract and universal. And so, too, uh, in the uh, 
a scientific project of abstracting, in a sense, from the world and trying to catch it in more and more uh, universal terms that are not domain specific, that are not uh, for a particular way. So this moving up and trying to, to, to stand outside of reality in a sense, which we cannot do, but we somehow aspire to do and have this overview as a kind of uh, alertness to, for ourselves to keep ourselves alive, saying, well, things are not self-evident. If you step back, you might see things that you take for uh, as self-evident as something to be more critical of. Uh, that fits with a sense of being inaccessible. The, the divine position is not accessible to us, but it's something to aspire to, uh, to be universal, free from all partial interests. Uh, but in a sense, it's not real. It's a limiting case. It's uh, powerful as an idea without being real in any uh, material sense. Is that interesting? Is that sufficient as a concept of God? There's one concern, at least there may be many more, but there's one that I wanted to mention, and that arose actually in a discussion not about uh, well, science or morality, but about the ontological argument. Uh, in an article in 1955, uh, Findlay, no idea who he is, but he wrote that it was indeed an ill day for Anselm when he hit upon his famous proof. So it's not a great discovery, but it was a, a problem. Why, says Findlay? Well, for on that day, he not only laid bare something that is of the essence of an adequate religious object, but also something that entails its necessary non-existence. Uh, the, the Anselm type of argument, the ontological argument, works from the definition, saying God is that greater than which we can think of nothing, or that which has necessary existence uh, in some of the versions. Uh, but it, it moves, so in the sphere of logic and, and kind of mathematical thinking. And Findlay's point is, mathematical objects don't exist. We have triangles or squares or whatever in our world or circles, but none of them is a mathematical triangle or a circle. If you measure the angles, and you would be able to do it in a perfect sense, or if you would look at the lines, they wouldn't be perfectly straight. Uh, nor would they be as thin as mathematical lines are, and so on. They, they are material objects, that, like the two triangles that were used by uh, Julian Barber. Uh, they represented triangles, but they were not mathematical triangles. Uh, the mathematical ones, well, we couldn't touch. Uh, they would, they're not part of this, this world. They're different in kind. And, behind the kind of Findlay objection is the, the distinction, I think, between sense and reference. Um, by definitions, you can fill in the, the sense, the meaning of a concept. So you can define what you mean by a unicorn, a horse-like creature with a, one a horn, or you can, but you cannot thereby establish that it must exist. Existence is different from the sense. And in a, the argument from Findlay is, in a sense, well, Anselm does something important in sphere of the ideas, but it doesn't deliver existence. I think that's a concern about this, or it might be a concern if you say, well, thinking about God, not so much this direction of ground, but this uh, supreme being as supreme abstraction is a position at least not available to us, but maybe it's more like this mathematical limit case which is an important conceptual tool, but it's not a reality, which raises a problem, at least for some of religious life, which of course in its more uh, human practice form does assume that, uh, that we interact with a being rather than with some abstraction. So I think in this sphere of reflections on, on uh, well, the cosmological argument and in, in the light of, of our understanding. Uh, there are interesting possibilities, but they are not, well, they're certainly not delivering an old man with a beard at the end of the chain. 
uh, but they do raise also issues of existence and how to think of it. I'll have two more sheets and one comment beyond the sheets. Uh, I think it raises this whole debate, a conference like this and others, raises not just issues of how to think about God, but also how to think about theology, about doing theology. And a natural theology was where I started, uh, looking for arguments. I don't think that that's a very viable type of project where you start with only the, uh, well, the kind of inductive approach where you look in the world and then you try to draw conclusions that bring you out of it. Uh, just two other polls in this debate before I get to my own. Uh, I think some of it, some thinkers have said, well, I don't have much interest in this whole debate. And a good a representative of that has been Friedrich Schleiermacher, around 1800, German theologian. Uh, he has lectures to the despisers of religious belief. Uh, this comes from one of those lectures, of course the original being in German. Um, well, but he there says, well, we, with cosmology and with ethics, religion shares to some extent that it talks about the same, um, well, the universe, everything, and our relation to it. So it's unavoidable in a sense, or at least it happens that religious thought and uh, either morality or cosmology or both, that that get mixed up. But then he says, we shouldn't do that. We should look at what's specific about religion. And he moves to something that I would translate as more existential rather than cosmological or uh, value-oriented, axiological. Uh, so Schleiermacher says, in order to take possession, possession of its own domain, religion renounces herewith all claims to whatever belongs to those others. And there he means cosmology and morality. Uh, it does not wish to determine and explain the universe according to its nature, as does metaphysics. Uh, it does not desire to perfect the universe, as does morals. Religion's essence is neither thinking nor acting, but intuition and feeling. It wishes to intuit the universe, wishes devoutly to overhear the universe's own manifestations and actions, longs to be grasped and filled by the universe, immediate influences in childlike passivity. Well, they're his words, but it's a kind of attempt to say, well, maybe there's another domain which is not the domain of cosmology, nor which is the kind of easy alternative for the liberal believer to say, well, it's mostly a moral issue, uh, but try to define it in a kind of separate category. Um, it does link with uh, notions that came up in some of the words about creation, uh, about our radical dependency upon the universe. So there is a kind of boundary there with the kind of cosmological questions. But then, uh, well, it's, it's, it's trying to set, and he's one of, of a strand of thinkers, theology is somewhat apart from the scientific uh, project. The other author I would like to quote is uh, Arnold McMullen. Uh, a historian of science, philosopher of science, Catholic priest, and he had an article on um, how should theology relate to cosmology in a book edited by Arthur Peacock, uh, which more or less ends with this passage. So he discusses how the Galileo affair is also about the interpretation and the freedom to take interpretation relative to scripture. He discusses some of the uh, interpretation of Big Bang cosmology quite critically as, as not uh, recommending not to take the, the kind of immediate shortcut from Big Bang to creation. Uh, and then at the end he has kind of passage where he gives the agenda that says the Christian cannot separate his science from his theology as though they were in principle incapable of interrelation. So he doesn't go for the Schleiermach type of separation. Um, on the other hand, he has learned to distrust the simpler pathways from one to the other. He has to aim at some sort of coherence of worldview, a coherence to which science and theology, and indeed many other sorts of human construction, like history, politics, literature, must contribute. He may, indeed must strive to make his theology and his cosmology consonant in the contributions they make to his, this worldview. Uh, 
but this consonance, as history shows, is a tentative relation, constantly under scrutiny in constant slight shift. So if, as I read this and, and appreciate this, uh, he emphasizes that we do aim at a certain integration, a certain bringing together, but that is a human construction. It's a creative project. We bring those together. It's not just something that we can prove that is kind of formal consequence of arguments and that's solved. It's not solved by the tradition for us either because it's something that we have to do in each generation again because conditions change, knowledge changes, experiences change. Uh, so there's this room for interpretation and construction in the project. And so there's also a lot of underdetermination to use a word that was mentioned before as well, because people can make different constructions. There's not one solution in which, well, he uses the word consonance, so kind of musical harmony, but that's of course a very liberal criterion. When do you think they are uh, in consonance? Uh, it's a very fluid type of, and uh, maybe there's a dimension of aesthetic, of personal appreciation in think this is a good way of bringing those together and not so much the conclusion of a formal argument where you end up with one position. Uh, so it's more this creative, constructive side, also in theology and reflecting upon what we learn from the sciences and what else in life experiences we bring with us and how we appreciate to, to see that as a larger constellation. I think that's a, a wise way of formulating the kind of program for uh, reflection on cosmology in relation to our worldviews. Maybe I should leave it there. I think this fits. So thank you very much. So do we have some questions, comments? Yes, please. I agree with you that there are no physical objects that are triangles. But I wonder, what do you think about numbers, like whole numbers? Do whole numbers exist, like one, two, three? Thank you. So whether natural numbers, one, two, three, uh, exist. There's a quote, I think it's Konecker, uh, that God created the whole, the whole numbers. The rest is made by the humans, the rest of mathematics. Uh, well, no, I, I think we, we have one chair or one table or, I mean, we do have issues where we have learned to count. Uh, but in, in the sense of existence that we use for normal existence, I don't think we can ever point to a number, but only to a representation of a number. So numbers are kind of universal things, well, things. Uh, it, it's the difficulty uh, that somehow are, uh, apply both to one apple and one orange and uh, one chair. Uh, it's an abstract object. Uh, oh, we okay. have the solution. So, <laughs> numbers are, are not things with G, but things with K. Things. <laughs> things. So there are thoughts. Ah. They are in our minds. Uh, a thoughts. Uh, think. Can you do that in Polish as well? Okay. So Julian Barber. Yes, uh, and was it uh, audible? So thoughts are in the brain, and as such as brain states, they are things again. Instantiated. Instantiated. Okay. Okay. Someone has a further argument on this subject or another question? Just a comment um, about um, uh, J.N. Finley's particular point about um, being as an abstraction. Uh, th there is, as a matter of fact, uh, considerable critique of um, 
of God as First Cause by a number of people represented, I suppose most famously by um, Robert Cummings Neville at Boston University. And basically he, as I understand it, at least as one version of it, is that he basically, uh, if you consider God as being, um, as essential being, he essentially, I think, considers it as an abstraction, just like Finley does. And, um, and as an abstraction, it, it, it is completely indeterminate. Um, and, then, and then, but if you go that route, uh, two things happen. First of all, that that, that, uh, that um, indeterminate being does not really correspond at all to the sort of being that comes through in the scriptures, either in, in Islam or Judaism or um, Christianity. And then, and then you have real trouble. But I think the, the, second, the second problem with it is essentially, although it's indeterminate being, it, it's, it's an abstraction and really doesn't, has nothing to do with existence. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 and so I think the thing is, is that this is where you have to take the analogous character of cause um, when you speak of first cause very seriously and you, you have to consider that this first cause or the creator is self-subsistent being but is existing and is really the plenitude of, of, of existence. So um, th th this is a discussion that, um, you know, that I had a number of years, a couple of months ago with David Burrell, who's one of the key philosophical theologians in the States, and um, this is sort of the critique he gave of Neville's idea. But anyhow, it's the... Yes, thank you. I, th I think the, uh, uh, the alternative, maybe the, I'm not sure about Neville, but how I would understand the alternative project is to emphasize more, to, to allow that it is fairly indeterminate, and uh, the word existence may not apply. I still say it's a very human, very important uh, part of human uh, thinking to have those kind of limit concepts and, and leave it at that kind of, and then say we have in the, in the cultural richness, we have all kinds of stories, but that draws, uh, pulls, say, scripture more to uh, part of the human heritage and, and the uh, Yes, yeah, so it emphasized more the contingency of the religious heritage as a cultural product, an important one, but still more human than, uh, than a truth value, maybe. Just a quick uh, comment about Jan Findlay, his uh, ontological disproof of God that you referred to. <clears throat> I take a part of what he was, the point he was making there, <clears throat> was that he was drawing on the philosophical uh, canard, perhaps, that no existential proposition could be necessary. This is something that Kant said in Critique of Pure Reason and established itself as a kind of uh, well-worn, familiar claim that has since come into question. Um, I mean, the, the thought is that uh, uh, the only propositions that can be necessarily true are propositions that are analytic, that are uh, simply defining concepts. Triangle is a three-sided figure. It can be true by definition. But the statement that there are any triangular things, that existential claim, right? Well, that's a synthetic judgment, and uh, it can't be necessarily true. So that has been challenged. I mean, people like Alvin Flanagan and so on, in his version of the ontological argument, has tried to argue that, that in fact, good arguments haven't been given for the claim that no existential proposition can be necessarily true. And he proceeds, proceeds to use modal logic to try to do some of that. So there's, there's additional layers to that whole, whole debate that are really interesting and engaging, I think revealing. But that wasn't really what I wanted to say. Uh, really, I thought it was very interesting, your fourth section, Beyond a First Cause. You were mapping out several interesting models or metaphors for how one might switch from causal language for thinking about God's relation to the world to some other kind of language. 
The first one was the axiom theorem relationship, right? Um, the second was a kind of presence absence relationship from Fowler's, uh, Fowler's book, uh, the, the space that contains the building, the white page in which the figure appears. Uh, then you got to Findlay and a kind of, I'm not sure quite how that one worked. So part of the question would be how the Findlay fits into that pattern. But on the axioms theorems, that's a relation of a, of a ground or a, excuse, of a, a ground in the sense of warrant, mm -hmm. right, or reason, as opposed to ground in an existential or ontological sense. Uh, so I think it's important to make that distinction. Nonetheless, I think that's a really interesting idea. So it's not really a question. <coughs> no, thank you. I think you're certainly right in how you described the Findlay paper about uh, existential proposition. So claims that something exists not being uh, necessarily true or uh, so separating those. And I'll be happy to reflect more on, on the discussion since. Uh, the other, um, yes, yeah, so I think I used indeed the kind of grounding in, in axiom and so on, which is more the justification that something is true than, than the existence of it, yeah. Uh, and then the, the absence kind of metaphor, and the other was the kind of uh, looking subspecie eternitatis, the kind of reflection from an abstract, uh, by abstraction, uh, to a more and more universal, but more and more uh, non-existing type of position as well. And that, yes, I think to, well, think about this is more like a project kind of, well, uh, exploring than that I know the answers. Certainly not. So thank you very much. Do we have, oh, Julian, is one more question or comment? Julian Babo. Thank you, there were some really lovely thought-provoking things there. I'd just like to raise one question and, and comment on, on Galileo and precision in mathematics. Um, everything we know, it comes from experience. And science really relies on, on a very meager part of our experience, uh, contiguity uh, and, and, and sort of congruence and things like that. Science is built up from that. And, and we regard that as authentic. Einstein put great weight on, on immediate contiguity in defining events and things like that. Now, out of the totality of our experience, shall we say very deep, gut feelings about things, are they authentic? Are they telling us something about the universe? After all, we are part of the universe. I'm actually a, very much in, if, if I'm anything, I'm, I'm with Spinoza. God is nature, nature is God. I'm part of nature there to some extent, I'm part of God in a very modest sense, I hasten to add. Now, I think Galileo must have had an incredibly deep feeling that nature is mathematically precise. It's one of the most extraordinary transformations in, in human history. There is this famous passage in, in Galileo about, I speak of the universe, the great book that stands ever open before us. But it is completely impossible to read it if we do not understand the language. And the language is mathematical in terms of triangles and so forth. And it was this conviction of the utter precision, the utter mathematical precision of nature that led him to seek the law of free fall. And this really completely transformed the world. And I think this is very remarkable. So was Galileo's deep gut feeling something authentic about the world? Or when one has very deep feelings, which transforms one's life, as I know, when I started to doubt the existence of time in a very deep way, it completely changed my life over a period of three or four days for 50 mm -hmm. years. Um, are these authentic? Are these telling us something really about the universe? Thank you. So the key point about our experiences, our, our deepest experience, gut, gut feelings, uh, um, I'm hesitant to say so because, I mean, Galileo had a very strong point about uh, understanding nature in mathematical terms, but all those others may have had gut feelings as well and we never heard of them anymore. I mean, so just to give a kind of blanco endorsement of any claim, well, that is how I feel it, 
I, I'm concerned that we have actually, if I talk with my students and so on, uh, often a too easygoing claim to a personal how I feel it, as if also in moral issues and so on. It's but also kind of in in these kind of philosophical discourse that. I, I, should, I, I agree with you. I should have added. There's a lot the, of work the, the, afterwards. The, the, the qualification is the, the wonders of the scientific method, where it is self-correcting. You go out and yes. you try, and uh, that's a, you make a hypothesis. You go out and see what its consequences are and test them. And no, I, I quite agree yeah. with your qualification. But I'm, I, what I'm wondering is, does one have direct access to deep truths in this sort of way? It, I just throw it well, out as a question more than as a statement. Of we that. are, in, of course, part of the universe, indeed, and so in that sense, we do have, we cannot avoid being part of it. Uh, but I would think uh, I would separate the kind of creative uh, moment, the idea, and that would be that gut feeling. Uh, I think I would translate it, and that in itself doesn't. Uh, I, I would be skeptical to give that truth value before and independent of the testing. So I think the, the testing is what does the work in the weeding out and, and the moral deliberation, also the public justification of saying, well, I think this is the right course of action and presenting it to others and, and being open to criticism. Uh, yeah, yeah, the final comment, there wouldn't be the testing if there wasn't originally the gut feeling. Yes, but some of those were wrong and... Uh, oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Thank you. So if we don't have any more questions, let's thank our speaker and all the speakers of the section.